This past week, we were able to easily see one milestone, not so easily see another milestone, and we're kind of in the dark about a bunch of things. Not just what's next for Starship and Artemis 2, but when. Hey everyone, thanks for your time as always. SpaceX pulled off a second straight completely successful Starship flight test on Monday, using its last version 2 prototype. And Thursday night, NASA Exploration Ground Systems moved the Artemis II Orion into the assembly building where it will be stacked for launch. What's next and when we might see something is unknown though. The government shutdown means that work continues on Artemis II, but access to updates, pictures, video, and live coverage is blocked. It's unlikely that Artemis II would launch during this government shutdown, but it doesn't seem so out of the question now. If that happens, we might only get minimal live coverage, in which case the story of the mission could be more about its secrecy than about its accomplishments. It also presents an ironic what-if scenario. What if there's more live coverage of China's first Taikonauts to visit the moon than NASA's astronauts? For Starship, it's on to version 3, but the spectacle of the live re-entry experiments still leaves us with little idea about how and when development will reach the Artemis tech demonstrations. And now there are more questions about how interested SpaceX really is in landing NASA astronauts on the moon. We know that SpaceX wants to go to Mars and has its own products and services to support, but doesn't talk about Artemis anymore. So where does that leave it on their to-do list? Late on Thursday, October 16th, Exploration Ground Systems moved the Artemis II Orion spacecraft from the Launch Abort System facility to the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center for stacking. The Launch Abort System tower was lifted and attached to the top of the Orion crew module in August, and then the crew module was encapsulated by the LAS Ogive fairings last month in September. Similar to other payloads, Orion has a launch fairing. It's just that Orion's is a two-piece. The service module fairings were attached earlier in the pre-launch processing flow. The Artemis II Orion has been in the KSC industrial area for a long time. Orion prime contractor Lockheed Martin assembled and tested the crew module and crew module adapter, and then integrated and tested the European service module. The crew module pressure vessel was bolted, but mostly welded, at the Michoud assembly facility in New Orleans. But the rest of the assembly and test occurred in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at KSC, in the industrial operations zone there. The primary and secondary structures for the crew module and crew module adapter were completed there, and then all the fluid tubing, electrical wire harnesses, and subsystem equipment were installed. The tubes for propellant management and use are welded, the wire harnesses are installed, laid out, and connected, and the equipment is installed and checked out. I made an overview video of Orion assembly and test if you're interested in more details. That's the link in the upper right. Artemis 1 finally flew just about three years ago at the end of 2022, near the end of the Artemis 2 build. But NASA and Lockheed Martin had intended to reuse some electronics from the Artemis 1 crew module, which meant that some aspects of production had to wait until those parts were available. That happened in early 2023. Lessons learned from Artemis 1 and a couple of issues found with an electrical circuit and batteries delayed the schedule for several months. Artemis 2 is the third and final planned Orion flight test. Exploration Flight Test 1 in late 2014 tested the crew module with a non-functional service module mass simulator. Artemis 1 was the first flight of the combined crew and service modules, minus the crew systems like life support and crew interfaces to the flight control system like displays and controllers. It was still a functional spacecraft and flew a four-week-long cislunar mission that orbited the moon and safely returned to Earth. NASA spent many months investigating unexpected behavior of the Orion heat shield during the program's first skip re-entry. They modified the way that the Avcoat material is fabricated for future Orions, but decided to fly the Artemis II spacecraft as is by taking out the skip part of the re-entry profile. Assembly and test of the Artemis II Orion was completed by Lockheed Martin at the end of April this year, and the spacecraft was handed over to Exploration Ground Systems for pre-launch processing. 
EGS spacecraft offline operations moved Orion from the ONC building to the multi-payload processing facility on May 3rd, where almost all of the commodities were serviced for flight. That included hypergolic bipropellant, monopropellant for the crew module thrusters, gaseous helium to safely manage storage and distribution of those propellants, and cabin atmosphere oxygen for the crew, among other things. The Artemis II flight crew participated in a suited launch day simulation and equipment interface tests in the crew compartment at the end of the MPPF's day in late July. Orion was then powered down, buttoned back up, and moved from the MPPF to the LASIF on August 10th. As noted earlier, the last tower was lifted on top of the crew module and bolted into the primary structure, and then the ogive-shaped fairing panels were lifted into place to encapsulate the crew module, and then those seams and the final detailing and closeout of those connections were completed. The LAS and crew module hatches have to work together, so those were also tested in the LASIF. And then we saw the move on Thursday night, with Orion finally leaving the industrial area after many years. The transporter and convoy team drove the spacecraft out onto the NASA causeway, and then turned north onto Kennedy Parkway towards the Launch Complex 39 area and the VAB. Media with live stream cameras at the KSC press site, including NSF NASA Spaceflight and Spaceflight Now, caught the convoy on the parkway as it got close to their location. These excerpts were taken from the NSF NASA Spaceflight Space Coast live coverage. I put a link to that ongoing live stream in the description. The convoy continued a couple of blocks farther on Kennedy Parkway before turning onto the old Shuttle Orbiter Towway, which runs from the artist formerly known as the Shuttle Landing Facility, into the north entrance of the VAB. This was the same route taken four years ago when the Artemis I spacecraft was driven from the LASIF to the VAB. The convoy took the Artemis II Orion on the towway past the old orbiter processing facility bays before it went out of view from the press site. They turned off of the towway to take the spacecraft into VAB High Bay 4, where it will be lifted up and over into High Bay 3 for stacking. EGS had estimated early this year that the work in the MPPF and LASIF would take five months once Orion was handed over. The move from the LASIF to the VAB was previously projected for early October, so the schedule did slip a handful of days over those five months. However, we don't know if that will impact the overall schedule. We don't know how much schedule margin EGS has, assuming that NASA is still targeting the February launch period, with the first window possibly on the night of February 5th. The programs involved are still working on mission analysis cycles, and the numbers were said, well, before the government shutdown, to be preliminary, so the dates and times of specific launch windows might change a little bit. But in terms of getting the vehicle prepared, being ready for the early February launch period would mean rolling out to the pad around the middle of January, which would mean getting into the final rollout preps right after New Year's. After Ryan is stacked, there are a few big full vehicle integrated tests to perform in the VAB, including a countdown demonstration test with the crew, and there's still two months to complete that. But first, Orion still needs to be stacked, or at least we're waiting to hear when that happened. EGS Spacecraft Offline Operations does a kind of handoff of Orion to EGS Integrated Operations, which has been working in the VAB to stack the Artemis II vehicle on Mobile Launcher 1 in High Bay 3. Lifting Orion up into the SLS integration cell, lowering it down and mating it to the Orion stage adapter is the next milestone, and we'll find out how much information NASA is willing to release while most of its workforce is furloughed. That full stack integrated testing in the VAB isn't as photogenic, but it's the last section of pre-launch preparations that needs to be completed, and when that's complete will help determine the earliest available launch period. While the government shutdown continues, we're not likely to find out much about that without the link from NASA Public Affairs to the Exploration Ground Systems program. SpaceX launched the fifth and final Starship version 2 prototype on Monday, October 13th from Starbase in South Texas. The 11th overall Starship flight test lifted off near sunset, and for the second time in a row, the booster and ship successfully completed all of their flight test objectives. 
These are throwaway prototypes that SpaceX is using to iterate toward a design that satisfies their operational criteria, which prominently includes rapid reusability. The priority remains on recoverability of the two stages, and this last version 2 prototype again included design and flight envelope experiments looking at, especially, the thermal protection system for the ship, which descended to a soft landing in the Indian Ocean at water level. As others have said, the data was the payload again for this flight test, and SpaceX got another full set from this one. It was another step forward in development, but that leaves us here on the outside in the dark about how many steps forward there are from here to the next big milestones. That's particularly true for NASA and Artemis, one of the anchor customers for Starship. Starship will be the lunar lander for the Artemis 3 mission in mid-2027, which is only seven quarters from now. In the flight test livestream, SpaceX talked about the next design iteration, version 3. That is currently forecast to begin flight tests around the beginning of 2026, but there wasn't much word about the sequence of flight tests or the timing of all the Artemis milestones currently forecast for next year. Basically, we don't know what the current status is, and we don't have any frame of reference. After the test objectives for that ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer demo are fully completed, then SpaceX and NASA can complete the HLS critical design review for the Option A lunar lander, which will take two U.S. astronauts to the surface on Artemis 3 for an almost week-long stay on the moon before Starship lifts off and returns them to Orion and their crewmates in the Gateway orbit. Before that can happen, an uncrewed lunar landing demo has to be completed. That will be the first Artemis demonstration of the overall HLS concept of operations. That starts with a depot in low Earth orbit, then launch of the uncrewed lunar lander test article, and a set of tankers to supply the HLS with enough propellant to fly from the Earth to the Moon and land on the surface. SpaceX has its own goals for 2026. A mission to Mars in the next transfer window and the initial deployment of next-generation Starlink satellites. Those were highlighted in the SpaceX livestream. In contrast, Artemis and the Moon were not highlighted, continuing a trend of SpaceX away from the Moon and Artemis that we've seen over the past year or so. Another contrast is in the way the Moon features in what information the two HLS providers are publicizing. Starship is pointed at the next Mars transfer window, which is only a year away. In contrast, Blue Origin seems to be pointing at the Moon. I have noted how secretive the private companies are, which is standard practice for private businesses. But to be fair, Blue Origin has been highlighting technology development for the cislunar transport and lunar landing architecture that will support Artemis lunar landings beginning with Artemis 5. In the past few months and few weeks, Blue Origin and CEO Dave Limp have posted news items about engine development for their lunar spacecraft, ground testing of cryogenic fluid management hardware, and the second launch campaign for their new Glenn launch vehicle, which will launch their lunar spacecraft into orbit and tankers for propellant transfer. Like SpaceX and Starship, Blue Moon uses propellant resupply. Unlike Starship, Blue Moon uses liquid hydrogen instead of liquid methane for the fuel. But the news we're getting from Blue doesn't provide much in the way of current status either. This test of a BE-7 engine shows an Apogee Ray's burn duty cycle for Mark 1, and this footage of another unit in a vacuum test don't say whether the flight engine for the first Mark 1 lunar lander has been installed. That spacecraft is said to be headed to a vacuum chamber at the Johnson Space Center in Houston for pre-launch thermal vacuum testing, but Blue hasn't updated that schedule since May. There are reports that the first Mark 1 lunar landing test flight could be launched on the third New Glenn, possibly early next year, but we don't have the critical path for that. It's possible the critical path is the New Glenn launcher itself, since there's still work to do in the second launch campaign but the path forward for the spacecraft and the launcher aren't clear. But we are getting a little more information from Blue, which is more relevant to Artemis, which the U.S. government still has focused on the moon, at least for the time being. 
It seems these days like Blue Origin's enthusiasm about the moon is very similar to the enthusiasm we see from SpaceX, but about Mars. During NSF NASA Space Flight's live coverage of Starship Flight Test 11, Jack Beyer hosted a discussion with authors Christian Davenport, Eric Berger, and Ashley Vance, all of whom you may be familiar with from their articles and books. They discussed SpaceX, Blue Origin, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and how much a part of their future NASA and Artemis might still play. If you are interested in watching that, it begins around 26 minutes in. I put a link to that broadcast in the description. That U.S. government shutdown stalemate is starting to look like it could last longer than the last one at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, which lasted about five weeks. That was only seven years ago, literally, but feels like it was in a different world. This time, the White House is using the next round of firings at NASA and other agencies, and the threat of more, as a part of the negotiations. But when everything is a game and winning is the only point, all of those details are secondary. That means that stuff like Artemis or space programs or jobs are secondary. In other words, everything is secondary, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. While we wait for someone to win and whatever secret prize that is, I'll keep track of what we were supposed to find out with Artemis and what we missed. Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy, who is acting NASA Administrator, posted a couple of still images on Friday morning of Orion, taken when it was outside the LASF before the move started. Last time, NASA Public Affairs provided a live stream of the Artemis 1 Orion when it was moved from the LASF to the VAB along with social media posts as it happened. They also provided still images and edited B-roll video afterwards. We'll see if there's time after the government shutdown for that, but it could be lost to history very quickly. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you find these videos informative and want to find out what's going on with Artemis every week. Big thanks, as always, to the members of this YouTube channel who are helping make it possible to keep doing this. I am posting additional content and updates if you're interested in joining. If you're willing to make a one-time donation to help support what I do, I would really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me a Coffee page in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.